Everybody good? Kelly? Okay, good. You're good. Here's a presentation that I, I thought would be interesting. Um, I usually talk about retirement, all the different types of investment products, financial planning, but with everything that we're getting with the GameStop, uh, you know, just a conversation we had this morning, you know, uh, can I get into that? Should I short it or just the different types of investments? I'm not saying anybody here said that, but that's what I've been getting as far as that goes. Uh, I think this is a great presentation. Uh, I'm going to be reading off of it off of one monitor and I'll be uh, screen sharing it. So bear with me. But um, this is really interesting because, and as we all know, this also can be for the rest of your life. How your brain can keep you from making wise and financial decisions. And also you can have your brain standing in the way of a lot of things that you're doing uh, with your business and your life. But we're going to stick to the investing part of it here today. Um, I strongly believe everyone deserves the opportunity to build a secure and comfortable retirement. Actually, it's a pretty tough thing to do. Uh, our mind keeps getting in the way. There's five cognitive processes that are hardwired into your brain that form the foundation to making retirement savings decisions rather challenging. There's five impediments to serve to make us our own worst financial advisor, okay? But what if you better understood these mental roadblocks and you see them when they're approaching you? What would you be able to do with this new knowledge? More to the present, where would you begin? Okay, consider the why. You have each very strong and personal reasons why having a comfortable retirement is important to you. That's why you work so hard. That's why you're here uh, building your business and, and growing your company here at uh, 8 in the morning. Okay, this personal why can drive you to accomplish great things. Now, it's my goal to give you the how-to. And in order to accomplish your personal why, let's begin by taking a closer look at each of the cognitive processes. So we're going to go to disclosures. Um... Presentations for informational purposes, not meant as investment advice. If you can read this for uh, for 20 seconds, investing involves risk. Waddell and Reed believes the information has been obtained to consider. And uh, there's our disclosures uh, for, the, uh, for the presentation. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, here's the five cognitive processes as far as uh, what we're going to talk about today. Number one is inertia. Number two is anchoring. Number three is loss aversion. Number four is present bias. And number five is identifying blind spots. That also comes in very handy on the parkway to keep you from getting in an accident. Okay, so we're going to go after those five processes. And here's a pretty entertaining, uh, inertia is going to be our first one. And we're going to introduce ourselves to inertia man. So what is inertia? It's a physics principle. If you had a high school physics class, Newton's Laws, a, motion, a thing that is in motion tends to stay in motion while an object uh, at rest tends to remain at rest. And we're going to talk about Inertia Man here. Inertia Man standing there, he could be one of the great superheroes. He could be Superman, Spider-Man. If he does the right thing, he might get the three-movie deal. You know, Kirsten Dunst is his co-star, leading lady. You know, great things like that. But he has to do the right thing, okay? Um, here we go. Inertia Man sidekick. Inertia Man, come quickly. If we don't stop the evil brain's robot arm from triggering the doomsday machine, Mega City will be destroyed. Now, Inertia Man had the opportunity of a lifetime to get the big movie deal, but he's still standing there. 20 minutes later, boom. You know, Mega City's destroyed. Yeah, he'd be lucky to get on a, a, a Sunday cable TV show now. You know, I mean, it's his, his deal's gone. But if we take a look at Inertia Man, you can relate that to real life. How many times have you felt this way while trying to get a family member or a coworker to take some desired action, even though that action would be good for them. And then you have the negative inertia of stock. You, they stand there and they never really make a decision. So that's, that's inertia man. Okay. So we'll go to something new here by inertia man. Here's something that's kind of interesting. Uh, these are organ donations by country. So if you look, uh, I'd like to share a study by Arnand Damani in 2015 in researching organ donors in Germany and Austria. They found that in Germany, only 12% of registered people were organ donors, or registered organ donors. While in Austria, an astounding 99% were registered organ donors. How could this be? Are Germans that much different from Austrians? Uh, you know, if you know, they share a border. Uh, they had some issues there uh, before World War II, where Germany uh, moved into Austria, so they're really close. They share a common language. For example, are people in Pittsburgh a lot different than people in uh, Monroeville? Are they really that much different? Probably not. Okay, the difference is it's not the people. 
it's the process. In Germany, it's voluntary if you want to donate your organs. So on a, you have to actually voluntarily sign up to do it. In Austria, they make it mandatory. So they say, you're going to be an organ donor. If you want to opt out, you actually have to make an effort to opt out of it. So, you know, 99% of organ donors, 1% don't want to do it. And, and that's fine. That's their prerogative. But you see where I'm going here. When it's automatic and it's, it seems to be mandatory, not mandatory, but it's already done for you, it's a lot easier to, to accomplish this. Okay, so we're going to go uh, to inertia. Okay, so automatic enrollment, if we take this to 401k plans, has a very similar effect as our previous example. The Vanguard Group published a study of its 401k plans, some of which utilized auto enrollment and others that used a more traditional voluntary enrollment. They looked at the new hires uh, less than one year, and what they found is those plans with the voluntary enrollment, obviously, uh, were a lot less than the plans at the auto enrollment. You know, that's a feature that helps people make decisions that may be good for them. Just getting started is not likely enough to ensure a likelihood of secure retirement. Let's think back to Inertia Man we just talked about. If Inertia Man sidekick had explained the situation, you could have gotten the movie deal, things could have been great, you could have saved the city, you would have been the hero, taken Inertia Man by the arm and walked him to the superhero uh, mobile and driven him to the scene of the robot army, together they might have stood a better chance of defeating the robot army, dismantling the doomsday machine, and saving Mega City. So, in reality, it's much the same when you work with a financial advisor, be it myself or someone else. I'm kind of like the sidekick to Inertia Man, but I'd, I'd probably be a little bigger than that guy as far as size. But, you know, that's what I'm here for, kind of helping you along the way because you're so busy running your businesses. It's hard, and, and when it's Inertia, uh, you know, I should invest in that this month, but you know what? I'm just not going to do that. I need to do this other things. When you have automatic, kind of like the organ donations, it makes life uh, a lot easier as far as that goes. So we're moving on from inertia. Let's go into anchoring. This is another uh, good subject. Okay, here's a question for you. What do an anchor, designer jeans, and home sales, this might be beneficial to some people in here might be interested, have in commonly? Seemingly not a lot, but stay with me. The second cognitive process uh, that we're going to talk about is anchoring. Anchoring is a human tendency to rely too heavily on one trait or piece of information, such as a cost of product or service. The process starts when an initial number or cost is introduced, and the mind immediately gets attached to that figure or anchor. We suddenly think, is that number too high or low? We all do this, of course. Then we subsequently estimate the cost a little higher or a little lower than that initial anchor. Yet we seldom think, what if that anchor is a bad figure altogether? The mind tends to have a difficult time rejecting the initial anchor and coming in uh, with a brand new estimate as far as from the original feature. Consider the following examples. Let's say your daughter is in desperate need of a new pair of designer jeans. Um, you take her shopping. Lucky you. It's not long before she finds the perfect pair of designer jeans. The price says $200 with 25% off, so they're really on sale for like $149.95. You tell her, sorry honey, no deal. The anchoring effect is at play here, okay? Her anchor might be $200, she thinks she's getting a discount. Your anchor might be closer to $50. So what is the right price for the designer jeans or anything else for that matter? It all depends upon your anchor. Home sales are another good illustration, I'm sure uh, Dee Dee and Deb deal with this all the time. How many of you remember the price you paid for your current home? What would you want? Would you want to list it for less? Probably nobody here would want to do that, right? Of course not, for obvious reasons. People are highly unlikely to place the home they have for a sale price under what they bought it for unless they're obviously in very bad circumstances or had to get out of it in a hurry. They are anchored at that initial purchase price, which is the reason why home sales were so slow following the 2008 mortgage crisis. So that's the, the figure of anchoring, and we all do it. You have a price in your brain, whether you're buying a car or something else, and if that price is way out of whack, what do you do in your brain immediately? No way. That's just way too expensive. And maybe you didn't have all the complete information uh, as far as that is concerned. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, just as with the pair of jeans or the home, anchoring also applies to personal savings. I believe employers have inadvertently given us a bad anchor regarding retirement savings rates. What levels of contribution are required in most 401k plans in order to maximize the matching contributions we receive from a lot of employers. A lot of times all you have to do is put in three, four, five, or six percent 
of pay in order to maximize uh, the matching contribution. So what do you think the most common saving, ra savings rates are? In a high school, in, in a high enough savings rate to give you a strong chance of having a secure and comfortable retirement, three, four, five, or six, probably not. Let me throw you a helpful anchor. Uh, shoot for a personal lifetime savings rate of 15% of income. I'm not just pulling this out of thin air. In the book, The Millionaire Next Door, written in the late 90s by Thomas J. Stanley and William D. Danko, the authors interviewed a number of millionaires of the time it, uh, to learn a lot of their traits and habits. One item they found is that over 90% of millionaires had a lifetime savings rate in excess of 15% or more. Okay, and more of that 50% had a lifetime savings rate of 20% or greater. They didn't become millionaires by accident. They were good savers. Having a secure retirement is not about what you make, it's about what you keep. How many people do you know they make all kinds of money, but yet they're always kind of hurting for cash because the money goes out even quicker than what, what they get it in. So, um, and then you see people that they have regular paying jobs, but yet they have, I've seen everything as far as a financial advisor business, as far as, uh, you know, and your anchor might say, well, this person might not have money, but he really is a millionaire. You know, like first impressions can be totally and completely wrong as far as that goes. That's one thing I completely learned. Now, we all aren't going to be millionaires, but it's worth noting it certainly is harder to become a millionaire by the, the late 90s than it is today. If we aspire to have a comfortable retirement, we can do what's necessary to pay ourselves first and accelerate the desired savings rate over time. That becomes even more important as the income gap expands. Okay, so let's move on. Here's another uh, example. As this graphic illustrates, incremental change in retirement income become, become a big deal over time. Social security and a company pension, if you only have one, likely will not sustain you through the duration of retirement. As you can see here, depending on your income needs, these two sources will only provide a percentage of what you may need. Uh, if your needs are modest, social security and a pension may cover about 80%. Um, however, the higher your income needs are, the less these sources will cover. This is where your personal savings rate comes into play. What if your family's uh, current savings rate, where does it need to be at a secure retirement and what incremental changes can be made to help get you there? A financial advisor can partner with you and help you find your anchor and move the needle in the right direction. Moving on. Okay, so here's one that's really interesting. I like this one, it's loss aversion. Okay, so here's the third cognitive process. We all have this fear to one, ex one extent. What if you had $50,000? A uh, substantial amount to save in your personal savings account. It takes uh, it takes a while to get to fifty thousand dollars in savings for for most people. Um, what? Let's pretend you and your partner have saved fifty thousand over the course of months or years, and it could be the down payment on a new home, a uh, fantastic uh, vacation house. It could be a college fund, and then I come along and say, Hey, you know what? Give me that fifty thousand dollars. We'll flip a coin. If the coin goes, uh, if you call heads and it goes on heads. I'll give you $150,000, three to one odds. But if if you lose the money, if it uh, falls on uh, the opposite coin, okay? Now, most people probably wouldn't want to take that bet. Uh, it's it's very risk. Uh, the risk is very high. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's something that most people wouldn't want to do unless you got drunk in Vegas and, uh, you know, you had access to your ATM. Okay, but we'll talk about that another time. Now, let's change the terms of the bet. Instead of 50K, what if you had $50? And with the understanding that you cannot visit the ATM for the rest of the day. Heads, you get $150. Tails, you lose your 50 bucks. Well, who is willing to take that bet now? Probably pretty much everybody here. It's a pretty safe bet. Uh, we're greatly averse to losing $50,000, but not so much with $50. Now, what if you could make this $50 bet over and over as many times as you like and look at your expected return on an extended series of coin flips and become more and more likely that it will be predictable over time. And that's basically what we're talking about with the stock market. You know, we're not looking to make a million dollars overnight, but if we can do well over a period of years uh, over time and, and win on these coin flips, theoretically investing in the market, uh, you can do well over, long, over the long term that way. And let's go here. Um, here's the stock market. It's another area which we're averse to losses, obviously. Uh, what do we know about the stock market over its history? On average, we've had a positive return uh, seven out of 10 years and a negative return three out of 10 years. We also know the long-term rate 
of return of U.S. large cap equities has averaged 9% over the last 90 years or so. Purely on a basis of expected return, we should always make that investment in the stock market right. Well, there's certainly more to that volatility for one thing. The chart shown here indicates the magnitude and duration of up markets versus down markets as measured by the S&P 500 since 1950. As you can see, the length and rise of bull markets is greater than that of bear markets, which always seems to catch our attention. Who can name a bear market? Any bear market. I know it's a Zoom presentation and we're all muted, so this is kind of designed for like a, a, an in-person presentation. We had the Great Depression, OPEC, oil crisis in the 70s, Black Monday of 1987, tech bubble burst in 2000, followed by 9-11, uh, the mortgage and debt crisis of uh, 2008 and 2009, and let's not forget the corona crash we just had 12 months ago, okay? Uh, that's Everybody can remember those. But how many of us can tell us how many times we've had bull markets? People pretty much just expect that to happen. We remember the negative because, yeah, there were bad times, but if you look at that graph, there's more good times than bad times. So moving on. Okay, moving on to this next, uh, this next graph. Loss aversion is rooted in fear which can lead to reaction-based decisions with less than desirable results, as this chart demonstrates. Let's consider the mortgage and debt crisis in 2009 as an example. When the Dow Jones Industrial Average dropped 8,500 points, many folks were inclined to move their investments to cash for fear of losing even more. Within a year, the market regained more than 3,000 points. For people who remained on the sidelines during that part of the rally, let alone all of it, they missed out on potentially substantial gains along the way. Left to our own devices, we tend to let our emotions get the better of us. Uh, ultimately chasing returns, buying high, and selling low. As you can see, this can be a very costly mistake. And we, we, I've hammered this before in the past that so we talked about this. Here's a great example. Everybody see Home Alone, a movie about 30 years ago. When the mom realizes that she left her son back in Chicago, Kevin! Um, she ultimately forgoes assistance from the authorities and takes matters into her own hands trying to get uh, home to her son. She takes a random series of odd flights and winds up riding through the night uh, back uh, in a moving van with a traveling polka van. All this to end up getting home at the same time as her family, who stuck with the original plan. When we bypass professional assistance and overmanage our financial accounts, we rarely wind up getting home uh, at the same time as everywhere else. And once the presentation's over, I'd like to expound on that a little bit more, but let's get through the presentation. Okay, so we have the charts here. Fully invested, the cost of missing the market, missing the best 10 days, 3.26%. Missing the best 20 days, missing the best 30 days, missing the best 40 days. So there's a cost when you get out of the market. Obviously, we hammer that home. So far this year, times have been good. But remember when times get crazy, kind of like what they did last year, the last thing you want to do is panic and sell out. And, you know, call me if you're having issues and, uh, you know, we can, we, can, uh, we can walk you through it. Okay, so we're moving forward. Here's another one called present bias. Okay, now present bias is the fourth cognitive process, and it's favoring the tangible now versus the intangible future. Okay, now our whole country is based on what do you see on TV every day? What do you see on commercials? I want this now. I want this fancy car now. I want this nice house now. I want the new iPad now. Okay, so our, our, we're really geared toward being in the here and now. The mind has a good grasp on making decisions that can affect what we experience in the present, but it often undervalues something that will potentially impact us in the future. How many people have heard of the marshmallow experiment? It is a famous behavioral psychology experiment initially performed in the 70s and has been redone in countless iterations since. It basically consists of placing a child between the age of four and six in a room with a big fluffy marshmallow. They did this experiment on me and that's why I gained a lot of weight. Um, you know, I'm talking to my attorney for some options here. Um, the experimenter comes in and says to the child, I need Lyle to get some paperwork and I'll be gone for 10 minutes. If you don't eat the marshmallow by the time I'll return, I'll bring back a second marshmallow and you can have them both. Then the experimenter goes behind the reflective glass to watch the child's reaction. What's interesting about this experiment is since it began, they've been able to follow up with these test subjects over time. What they learned is that the children who abstained 
from the marshmallow tended to get better grades in school, got into better colleges, went on to make more money uh, during their careers. Now don't go all freaking out and, and, and subject your kids to these experiments at home. There are ways to improve the results of these children reacting to the tangible now. If a distraction was provided, for instance, a book to read or activity to complete, a much higher percentage were able to ignore the urge to eat the marshmallow, that wouldn't have been me, and focus on their attention on the distraction. How many people value a college education for their kids and grandkids? Uh, most of us would agree a college education is extremely valuable and worthwhile to complete. Uh, this is one area where our society, by and large, bestows value on an intangible future uh, asset by paying for higher education in exchange for greater earnings potential over lifetimes. Example 529s uh, would be there. Okay, so moving forward, how that applies to us, we're going to move forward from these beautiful marshmallows. Okay, so let's look at present bias with us. Okay, this uh, the fourth cognitive is present bias, the favoring and the tangible now. i got to move on to the next one, my bad. Okay, so a question for you, what's the first thing you do when you open up your account statement or log into your internet to view your 401k or other retirement accounts? You're going to look at the balance, right? That's the first thing you look at, the big number that's uh, uh, there. That's what you look at. Understandable. You want to see how you're doing now. How many of you take the time to look at the current balance and use that information and a number of other variables and assumptions to project what level of income you could generate off of that in the future? Uh, now and during retirement. Not too many of us people really want to look at the here and now and where they're doing right now. Our account balance is the tangible now. Our retirement income is the intangible future. Yet while the vast majority of us are saving for retirement in some way, very few of us bother to calculate how much we need to accumulate in order to generate the amount of retirement income. The financial planning process can help you identify that and also most importantly when you get those statements, let's say it's a bad, the market crashes like a year ago, when you get those statements in the mail or they're online, you, it's really hard to even look at them at that point. It takes a lot of courage to do that. But you got to remember, don't let your emotions get in the way. This is just the here and now. Uh, we're preparing for the intangible future as far as that goes. So uh, you want to remember as far as that goes. Okay, let's go down here. Identifying blind spots. Uh, I, I take blind spots a lot more seriously when I almost got hit by the car on the parkway. I turn my head now and look, but uh, here's the fifth and final process we'll cover today, identifying blind spots. Um, if you guys want to do this, fine. If not, because I always hate activities, but feel free to do it. Um, if you'd like in the next minute, write down your 15 favorite foods. And I'm supposed to give you 60 seconds, but we'll move on here. You can think about them in your mind. How many of you came up with five, 10? For most people, it's relatively easy to come up with a few, but harder for uh, to come up with more than 10. Now, what if I were to provide you with a list of 100 foods and ask you to select your favorite 15 foods from that list? A much different result, as you can imagine. Producing your own list is your, free, is your free recall memory at work. We just demonstrated it's challenging to reach into the gray matter and come up, come up with things out of thin air. Selecting a list for, is your ranking memory. When prompted, it's relatively easy for your mind to move past the blind spots. Okay, so once again, this is more of an interactive presentation, but I thought it was important to share, so bear with me. It asks you to do some things uh, as far as that goes. Um, you might want to try this. Take one or two minutes and list the goals you have uh, for retirement. So uh, this might be something you might want to do. List the goals you have for retirement. Write them down. Um, shown here is the goals you have uh, for retirement. So here's a wide ranging list of retirement goals. And if you wrote your retirement goals down, see how many match up. Recreation, financial freedom, leaving a legacy, charitable giving, volunteerism, traveling, uh, wealth transfer, spending time with the family, second career, and as we all love, self-improvement. So... What you want to do is see how many match up uh, with those uh, with those goals, and if we move forward, what is your why? So we cover these five things. Okay, tonight we talked about inertia and the importance of getting started. Remember, inertia man, he didn't get the movie deal because he just didn't do anything. He sat there while the city uh, was destroyed. The risk of anchoring too low at a savings rate, uh, you know, hey, I'm just going to save X amount of savings rate because my company's going to match up to that percent of a savings rate. 
that's where I feel comfortable at. Um, loss aversion, when left to our own devices, this can cause us to make poor investment decisions. I kind of want to expound on this a little bit and go off topic. Um, you know, we're talking about the Robin Hood and the trading, and I, I can't caution. I saw a story that was really tragic. Not trying to be a downer here today, but on Robin Hood, um, this, this teenager decided to start trading on Robin Hood. And he started trying to trade in options, which options are extremely risky. It's an extremely sophisticated scenario. He shouldn't have been approved to be trading on options, but Robinhood, you just enter and you're not really talking to a real advisor, not knocking Robinhood. This is all the online places. He got approved for options trading and um, there was a mistake that the investment firm said he lost $735,000 and that was impossible. He invested like 5,000. There's no way that could happen. And then it sent him a letter saying, uh, we need $175,000 into this account by next week. And he tried to write letters. He tried to contact him. Like a lot of places today, you don't get customer service. So he sent an email for Robin Hood and he's thinking his life is absolutely over. And it was so sad. I wish, I wish his, his parents would have been clients of mine and I wish they would have reached out to me because I would have sat him down. He ended his life because he thought his life was absolutely ruined because he thought he was $735,000 in debt. It was a total error. He was never had to owe $735,000. I would have sat him down. I'd love to have talked to him. But even if he did owe $735,000, it's America and you can get out of it without having to ruin your life. So be very careful when you see young people kind of getting involved with online trading apps because, you know, that's a horror story that you don't want to have happen. And, you know, if, if a brokerage firm says you owe them this amount of money or anything kind of bad ever happens to that with an online firm, please talk to me and we will talk to them and, and try to settle it. But that's something that really, not to be a downer today, but I thought that was very important to bring up because we're all talking about the game stocks, the Robin Hood trading app. You know, when you're dealing with those sites, you're on your own. You're on your own. It's, a, it's an online investment. Uh, to get approved for options here would be very tough. You would, we'd have to look at your investment history if you're ready for it. And he just got approved and basically was like a 16-year-old with a learner's permit driving a Lamborghini uh, for the first time. And it was just really sad. But let's, you know, I just, I want to stay on a positive, but I thought that was important to bring up. And I've concluded. Thank you very much. Sorry about that. If you had to go, then you, you went. But so um, I know that Mike is always available for questions. So if you ever want anything, like I always say, now's really not a good time to discuss your specific investment needs in sure. front of all of us. But uh, I know that Mike will have a conversation with you about anything that you are thinking, wanting to know about. You know, if you want to just have an exploratory session. So, Mike, I just can't say enough good things about you uh, professionally. You do an amazing job. So. I put my, my cell number in there. Everybody can get a hold of me. So, And as I said, you know, it's not like we have to do business. If you have a question about anything, if uh, you have a relative trading on a Robinhood app and you're concerned or, or anything like that, just any question in general, that's what I love to do. I love to help people and, you know, don't feel any obligation like you have to do business with me or anything Uh just like everything else, you, you, you try to be positive and you help people, it always comes back to you in a good way. So I apologize my presentation ran kind of long, and uh, thanks for sticking with me. That's all right. It's, I also blame myself because I start the meeting 10 minutes late, so I'm probably like, started the meeting at 8. 